All right. Well, here we are ready to take the turn from philosophy to intellectual roots. We've covered our basic ideas and our approach to the truth and aesthetics and politics and values and Jewish identity and Jewish history and all those variables, how they intersect with each other. Now we're turning to this phenomenon of intellectual roots. Who else in the Jewish past had ideas like ours or created communities somewhat similar to the way we do it and with a similar approach to Jewish identity? What motivated them? What were they successful with? What were their shortcomings? Um, why are some of them not around anymore and others are? And uh, what can we learn from what they got right? Um, and after all, you know, we're in the business of learning from the past uh, in general, uh, and that might apply as well to creating a meaningful community for secularized Jews. Uh, we're not the first ones to have come up with this idea of creating a Jewish community even after one's no longer particularly religious or theologically inclined. Now, when we talk about intellectual roots, we can think about them in terms of more distant and closer in time, but also more distant in concept and then closer in to who we are. So in theory, all Judaisms can point back to the Hebrew Bible as one of their roots because it was created by the Jewish people centuries ago. It's the fun fundamental uh, mythology and stories, like the first library that a lot of later Jewish literature is commenting on and responding to. You know, it's the intertext for later books. Um, it documents some of the historical events or claims to document some of the historical events, but there, there is some history in there too. It's not all mm -hmm. myth um, that are part of the foundation story and actual history of the Jewish people. So they all draw on that, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a forebearer directly of a secular and humanistic approach to Jewish life because it doesn't reflect a secular and humanistic approach in most of its books. There are a few, Song of Songs, Book of Esther, Ecclesiastes, you know, they're asking humanish questions in our direction, but they're not directly a secular ideology of Jewish life. Um, as you move forward in time, you'll get things like the rabbinic Judaism, which comments on the uh, biblical legacy, sometimes softening it in a more human focused direction, but also again, very theologically focused, very uh, focused on prayer and ritual and, and God directed. If you read the actual meaning of the prayers in the rabbinic prayer book, it's very much about God and not as much about what people can do for themselves or how we need to rely on ourselves as we might put it. When you get to the early modern period, you begin to see inklings of change. People like Spinoza, who begin to ask uh, questions about God and the universe and science and even about the Bible that are the same kind of questions we ask. Um, with the dawn of the Enlightenment, you also have a Jewish style of Enlightenment called the Haskalah. It comes from the same root as Sechel, which in Yiddish means like wisdom or sense. Uh, the Haskalah is the uh, opening up of Jewish minds, analogous to the Enlightenment in Western Europe, um, bleeding over into Eastern Europe a little bit later. So if the Enlightenment is in, say, mid to, uh, uh, call it the 18th century, broadly considered, um, in Jewish life, the Haskalah begins to have more of an impact at the end of the 18th century, with Moses Mendelssohn, and then particularly in the first half of the 19th century. And that begins to propose changes in Jewish life. You have the dawn of the reform movement, where they translate the prayers into German, or then into English when they're in America. Uh, and they modify the prayers, and they modify Jewish practice to enable people to work on Saturdays, um, or to go to university and study modern ideas. They also criticize the Bible in its historical reception, and are willing to change some of those practices, even the ones defined there. So that's, again, a step in our direction, but it's not particularly who we are. It really isn't until the end of the 19th century that you begin to get a number of Jewish movements that are really pushing in our direction. We'll talk more about the Reform Movement in a later class, but our first two approaches to Jewish life we're going to be looking at today and next week are ethnic Jewish identities, ones that describe the Jews as a nation. But in that 19th century sense of an ethnic group, that has a common history, language, culture, um, and possibly political aspirations, or maybe simply cultural aspirations. Um, we have to remember that in Eastern Europe at the time, you've got two major multi-ethnic empires where the Jews live, the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and both of those allowed varying degrees of cultural autonomy to the subgroups under the dominant power. So if the Russians are the dominant power and the Austrians are the dominant power in uh, their respective empires, nevertheless, there are islands of Czech language and Serbian language and Albanian language 
or Ukrainian language, or Polish language, and so on. Uh, depending on, uh, on the level of autonomy the empire is granted, there was a possibility of an ethnic group being able to run its own cultural affairs. And we'll see some Jews begin to advocate for that in Eastern Europe, but using Yiddish as their national language, rather than Hebrew, which for them is an ancient language, not what they speak every day. Um, so in that 19th century period, what we today would call an ethnic group, they were calling nations. And so there's two varieties mainly of Jewish ethnic nationalism in this period, Yiddish-focused nationalism, what we often call Yiddishism, and Hebrew-focused Jewish nationalism, what today we call Zionism. Uh, hmm. So they were focused on which language is going to be the core language of the Jewish people. The irony is most of the Zionists, having grown up in Eastern Europe, spoke Yiddish <laughs> as their daily language anyways. <laughs> so they were actually having Zionism versus Yiddish arguments in Yiddish half the time because that's what everybody <laughs> spoke. So, um, you know, it's two people divided by a common language. So uh, this was one of the um, developments in this period we'll talk about more next time when we talk about the uh, Hebraists or the Zionists, but um, the, the, the dominant group around the year 1900 was in fact the Yiddishist approach. You know, if you were trying to decide which group to join in 1900, the Zionists had this cockamamie pie in the sky idea they would move to a part of the Ottoman Empire and somehow get them to grant a territorial uh, uh, autonomy for a Jewish nation to be started in Hebrew, which is a language that most people didn't read and didn't understand and couldn't speak. Where the Yiddishists were focused on what they called doikite, fixing it here and now, uh, after the word do, which means here in Yiddish. Um, they were focused on doing it in the language the Jews already spoke and dignifying Yiddish as a, a national ethnic language worth celebrating and creating in and translating works from European languages into this language. Um, and it was already there. You know, you were starting from a, a known place uh, rather than imagining that you uh, had to go somewhere far away. Um, so the Yiddishists had uh, a lot going for them. And um, uh, as we'll see, they became a mass movement for a long period of time. But before we get into the, um, oops, I have a shed in here. Before we get into the um, Yiddishist um, approach, I have to tell you a little bit about the background to uh, Yiddish itself, uh, the Yiddish language. Now, the Yiddish language uh, finds its origins in the Rhine Valley, uh, what a territory that actually became referred to as Ashkenaz in Jewish life. That's where you get the word Ashkenazi or Ashkenazi to describe people of that background. Uh, but it actually starts in the German language heartland of the Rhine Valley. Is that some, come from something, Ashkenaz? I mean, So Ashkenaz is actually a geographic designation in the Hebrew Bible, but it basically means way up yonder in the north. Oh, okay. And Sepharad is a designation in the Hebrew Bible for way out west. It becomes the name for Spain. Oh, so, that's why Sephardic. Right, it's like okay. Sephardic. So they take the biblical names and they apply them to these places that they hadn't been when the Bible was being written, right. but they were you know, way up that way and way out that way, so they figured close enough. Okay. Um, so Ashkenaz comes from that, uh, that biblical uh, hmm. a background. Uh, but the language is Old High German, more or less, uh, probably around the year 1000, although we don't really know because we don't have written records for a long time. Just like the church wrote in Latin, even if people were speaking a different vernacular, um, people just didn't bother to write it down. Um, in fact, one of the quirks is um, Rashi, who is a, a biblical commentator who lives in Troyes, which is close to the Rhine Valley, a little bit further west into France, um, around the year 1000. Sometimes in his commentaries, he'll say, uh, in translating a particular word, uh, the Targum of Onkelos into Aramaic calls it this, and in Loaz, or the, the language of the people around me, they call it X. And it's some of the first time anybody wrote down what the French people were actually speaking because the church didn't care. So actually scholars of ancient French, or you know, uh, old French, I guess, um, have to know some Rashi or study a little bit of it to see how he uh, is trying to pronounce the, the words that they would have used. So uh, nobody was speaking the vernacular, was writing down the vernacular, and the same was true for Jews. They were speaking uh, a German uh, in Hebrew letters maybe, or with a particular accent, but it was basically old high German. Um, and the first inscription we have of anything written in Yiddish comes from around the year 1270. So probably 200 years or so after the language began to uh, be created, there's a blessing in a prayer book for the high holidays. And whoever holds this prayer book will be blessed. But it says it in Yiddish and not in Hebrew. So somebody just wrote it uh, as a wish for themselves. 
um, what really makes Yiddish fascinating is not that the Jews were speaking the language of the people around them, because they had done that in other places too, like Judeo-Arabic was also a common language in that part of the world. What made it interesting was they kept speaking it as they moved further east. Beginning in the 1300s, you have the Black Death, you have uh, persecution of Jews in various cities, you also have the rise of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in Eastern Europe, which wants Jews and Greeks and other people with mercantile skills to come in and help develop the economy there. So Jews are both pushed out of Western and Central Europe and invited in to Eastern Europe. So they wind up in Poland, Ukraine, many of these territories. They're not allowed in the Russian Empire for a long period of time, but the other parts of Eastern Europe, they're able to settle there, but they kept their language as they moved. Because after all, who needs to speak the peasant language as your home language? It's not elevated, it's not cultural, it doesn't give you economic opportunities. Um, the Russian um, the royal family spoke French, yeah. as one example. There wasn't a lot of respect for Slavic languages in that period. And even Ukrainian wasn't written down until the 19th century, yeah. I think. Hmm. So uh, the Jews moving into Ukraine, Poland, and those areas didn't bother, they, they learned Polish Ukrainian for business purposes, but they didn't make it their home language. They kept that Germanic language and it evolved in its own way. You know, whenever there's a branch off in languages, like you know, the French uh, style of uh, in uh, in Quebec is slightly different from the French in France because they they broke off the tree and they evolved differently in different places. Or English in Appalachia versus in the other regions. Afrikaans and Dutch. Afrikaans and Dutch, another great example. So Pennsylvania Dutch. Yeah, Pennsylvania Dutch too. So uh, the same was true for this Jewish German or Yiddish Teich, as it was sometimes called, which means Jewish German. Um, Yiddish, in fact, in Yiddish means Jewish. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the language. <laughs> they have a different word for the language, which we'll look at. Um, so as they moved east, um, the language began to evolve in its own way, with its own accent, and also involving other language elements in it. Uh, Yiddish, as it finally evolved, was about 80% German, um, with the basic language like, you know, eins, zwei, drei in German becomes eins, zwei, drei in Yiddish, but it's very recognizable one to the other uh, for one, two, and three. Um, there are a fair number of Hebrew words that make it into the language, all the holidays, obviously, mm -hmm. Shabbos and Sukkot and uh, Simchus Torah, and the word Torah itself, you know, makes its way over. Even the word uh, Chacham is a sage from the word Chacham in Hebrew. It has a slightly different accent. You might notice instead of Shabbat, with a hard T. In Yiddish pronunciation, it's Shabbos, with a softer sound, and the emphasis is on the second to last syllable, or Sukkot becomes Sukkot. But it's the same words, just applied differently, and occasionally they add a slightly different meaning. So, for example, you have the word Sefer, which means book in Hebrew, and in Yiddish there's two words for book. There's the word Sefer, which is for an important book, a religious book, and then there's Buch, which is just German. a book. Right, an ordinary book, or bicker would be the plural. So, uh, yeah, there's ordinary books and there's important religious, you know, uh, weighty books, and you could even debate, is this, a, is this a book or a sefer? And if you translate that argument, it wouldn't make any sense into English, because is it a book or a book? You know, <laughs> or a book or a tome, maybe, you know, you'd find other words, but mm, yeah. it'd, be, it'd be tough to find the equivalent, yeah. and that's sort of the play in the language. And even the word chacham, which means sage, could also mean like wise guy when you put it into the Yiddish <laughs> accent. Oh, he's such a chocham, he's such a sage, you know, he thinks he's so smart. Um, but, you know, that's, the, that's again the play with language. So you have mostly German, about 8% German, maybe 10% Hebrew, and then you have some other languages mixed in too, about 5% are Slavic languages. Uh, you might know the um, Yiddish word for grandma is babi, babi which, is right? babushka. which is like baba yeah. in Polish and Russian, or babushka is what the grandmother wears, right? Um, and then you occasionally even get Latin roots that make their way in there too. So uh, when you're blessing on a meal, uh, you would say I'm uh, benching. To bench is to bless on a meal, but it's from the root benediction, hmm. uh, which is a blessing in Latin. So, um, so there are occasional other, other phrasing that works their way in from other languages, but again, it's predominantly German, a chunk of Hebrew, um, and some Slavic words and other vocabulary mixed in. Um, and sometimes you have interesting words that evolve. So um, in Hebrew, there's a phrase for the, the master of the house is Baal Habayit. You say that in Yiddish pronunciation, it becomes Balabos, because of the, again, the T at the end becomes an S. Um, but instead of going back, when you're talking about the wife or, as the master or mistress of the house, instead of going back to the Hebrew, which would be Baalat Habayit, 
they just take the phrase of balabos and put the Yiddish ending on it, so it becomes balabusta. Hmm. Or the other example that many people are familiar with is a prayer shawl is a talus, mm -hmm. or talit in the Hebrew, but talus in Yiddish pronunciation. And the plural should be talitot, because that's the Hebrew plural for one talit. Hmm. However, because the word talus was known in Yiddish, a lot of people will just say talesim, which actually is the masculine plural ending, instead of the feminine plural ending, which is the ot ending they should have done in the Hebrew, because they took it as a set word in Yiddish and then added a conventional plural ending on it there. Hmm. So this is, this is, again, the quirks of this, like, it's almost a kind of internal bilingualism, where they, they have Yiddish for some things and Hebrew for other things. Um, in fact, the word for Yiddish in Yiddish was mamaloshe, which means mother tongue. It's what you learn at home. It's what you learn from your parents. It's, and it's the language in which you're raised. The Mamaloshin was Yiddish, but the Loshin Kodesh was the holy language. That was Hebrew. So what do you pray in? What do you study the Torah in? What do rabbis write letters to each other in? Um, even the early enlighteners started a kind of Hebrew essay or Hebrew short story format as their classical language. Uh, to go back and write it down and to print it in newspapers. But Yiddish is, done, Yiddish is, is written, though, in Hebrew letters, correct? Right? It is. However, there is a slight difference. Okay. Um, and the difference is that the, um, the, the Hebrew alphabet doesn't include the vowels. Those are little right. dots and dash right, lines. Right. In Yiddish, letters count as vowels. So an aleph is an ah sound or an aw sound if it has a different mark on it. Mm -hmm. And a vav is an o oh or an oo oh sound. And a dot is an e sound. But you often have a yud for that as well. So you, Yiddish books actually are longer than Hebrew books because they have all the vowels in there. But it's also somewhat easier to read because you've got all the vowels in so there. So you, you could tell learn. immediately by just looking you at could it. Tell it Yiddish immediately. Yiddish or, or Hebrew, yes. even if you didn't really. You could tell automatically what it is. I've seen Yiddish books in Roman. Is that yes, so, modern? Yes, that's very modern. So why? Okay, I don't question, but if they're if they if the people in the Rhine Valley are speaking German in effect, and eventually mm -hmm. it becomes Yiddish, did they never use the, the same alphabet that, no. that the Germans they, they always just used? And, and this is the same thing that happened with Judeo-Arabic. Jews would take Arabic and write it in Hebrew letters, or Judeo-Farsi, they take Persian and write it in Hebrew letters. That, that's, this is the alphabet that Jews use portably. Hmm. Um, and they didn't always learn the outside alphabets, other than for business purposes. But um, again, you know, if, if you're so talking like to someone... On it. It seems like there should be some. I mean, Hebrew's got less letters, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. So you approximate. Okay. okay. Uh, but you know, also look. Uh, sometimes it's easier. Um, you know, you want to write Hanukkah in Spanish. They have a ch letter, which we don't have in English. It's the chota. So you write Hanukkah J A N U K A in Spanish. So sometimes there's easier translations, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's trickier. There's no v sound yeah. in Hebrew, so you do a v instead. Um, so, anyways, yeah. um, the. Um, the language was split not only for everyday life, the Mamalosh and Yiddish, and the holy work um, of Hebrew, but it's also a gendered split because the women are not in the synagogue. They're not writing the legal documents in Hebrew. They are literate in Yiddish because they might know the Aleph bed and they certainly speak Yiddish like everybody does, um, but they're not creating Hebrew. So there really is a gendered split in the language as well between Yiddish as the women's language, although men speak it too, and Hebrew as the province of men, for sure. So Yiddish is sort of everybody, and, and Hebrew is really for uh, men. Although there are some examples in the Middle Ages of prayers written for women, some even debate whether they were by women, uh, in Yiddish. They're called tachines, which are about women's concerns, about uh, matchmaking and childbearing and um, you know uh, the, the domestic concerns that people imagined women were focused on. Um, but the other major uh, Yiddish work at the time is actually a retelling of the Hebrew Bible into Yiddish with a lot of rabbinic legends added in. And it was called the Tsena Urena, which means the go out and see, but it's in the grammatical form of a second person plural female command. So it's y'all women, go out and see. Um, so it's clearly directed at, at a female audience. And in fact, in the frontispiece of the book, it said, this book is for women and for men who are like women. <laughs> now, what does that mean? It means men who can't read Hebrew. Because real men would go to yeshiva long enough that they could read Hebrew, and they could read the, the, the Hebrew Bible in the original. They wouldn't need this. But men who are like women are the men who 
can't read Hebrew, they can only read the Mamalashan, Yiddish, and so they have to rely on this book, which is, again, at a lower you know, uh, status level. You can tell by some of that rhetoric. Okay, so that's a quick hmm. overview of Yiddish historically. Now, beginning in, I guess I said, in the late 19th, early 20th century, Yiddish begins to be elevated by particular styles of uh, Jewish uh, secular individuals, ideologues, and movements uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, there's a number of reasons why Yiddish actually is attractive to create the core of a non-religious Jewish identity in this period. I mean, people are becoming non-religious for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's science, sometimes it's university study, sometimes it's you know comparative religion, where you look at all religions and realize they're all wrong, <laughs> instead of they're all somewhat right. Um, and in some cases, they were very involved in socialist politics. And you may recall one of the key aphorisms of Karl Marx is that religion is the opiate of the masses, to keep them in a stupor and passive and not advocating for themselves. So, you know, the communist movement broadly was anti-religious, and some Jewish socialists also became anti-religious for that reason. Um, there's actually a, a famous advertisement from New York in the 1890s that uh, advertised a cold nidre ball with, you know, non-kosher food. On, on the evening of Yom Kippur, let's have a ball and celebrate our freedom um, after, you know, 57, 60 years after the creation of the idols and um, 1892 after the birth of the false messiah. And so it was anti-religion in all directions. But these Jewish anarchists were interested in sort of thumbing their nose at the, um, at the religious world. Um, so that was part of the, the secularization too. So why was this attractive? For a secular Jewish community to use Yiddish. Well, one reason was that it was focused on the ordinary people. These aren't the fancy elites that are learning Hebrew. These are the the prostitutes, as they say, the poor Jews who all they know is Hebrew, including you know both the men and the women. Um, and so you're dignifying their uh, knowledge they already have by saying, "Look, you're already speaking a valuable national language," as opposed to saying, "You're insufficient. You're limited. You don't have the real Jewish language." You, they're saying you already have a national language that the masses are speaking and, uh, and it's valuable and deserves to be respected like other minority languages in these multi-ethnic empires. They began to advocate for what's called cultural autonomy, the ability to run their own schools in their own language, print their own newspapers in their own language, deal with the government in their own language, um, have private meetings in their own language. One of their advocates pointed out that um, under the, uh, in Germany, the workers' meetings had to all be conducted in German so that the government spies could know what was going on. <laughs> because if they held them in Polish, they wouldn't know what was going on. So they required them to do it in that language that the workers didn't speak. So how are the workers to fully participate? So, so there's an advocacy for what's good for the workers who aren't going to learn another language to be able to speak in their ordinary language they use. One of the debates that came about, though, was are we socialists who just happen to be using Yiddish for now? And so then it doesn't really matter and we might as well learn English or Russian or whatever. Or are we really Jewish socialists who see a lasting value in our Jewish cultural heritage and in the language that we're speaking? The first Jewish, uh, secular Jewish school was started in 1910 by one of these socialist Jewish organizations. And it sparked this debate of what are we, if we're teaching kids, what are we teaching them? Um, and this is supplementary to the public schools. So what, what, what do we want to use this time for? What do we want to drill into them? Is it, is it just socialism and we'll use Yiddish because that's what they happen to speak? Or do we really want them to know the Hebrew Bible stories and Yiddish literature in, the, in its modern forms and to create Yiddish literary journals that they might read and have them learn how to write Yiddish and not just how to read it in a temporary way? Um, so that was part of the debate that they were uh, settling out. Um, a second reason why Yiddish and the socialist approach was valuable from a secular Jewish community is that it was focused on this world. You know, it's, we want to fix this world here and now and not imagine a time, well, I mean, there was sort of socialist imagining of the utopia to come, but the idea was to work for here and now as well, to strike and to improve working conditions and not just put up with it because in the next life it'll be better in a karmic kind of uh, vision. Um, and you also, by emphasizing this Yiddish culture, we're drawing on the emotional resonance of memory. Mm. You know, people even in Germany or in England or in New York or Chicago had memories of the old country, of growing up in this, these areas, singing these songs, learning this language. It was called Mama Lotion because your mama spoke it to you. Mm. 
Now, sometimes it got a little schmaltzy. Uh, there's a famous song about Yiddish that people use today called Oifen Pripachuk, which imagines that on the hearth, the rabbi's teaching the kids the Aleph faith. We sing it at our uh, services as well. It was written for the Yiddish stage in New York, not in the old country, by a man named Max Warshawski, and he wrote it schmaltzy because he wanted to evoke that memory. Uh, people now think of it as an old country song, but in fact it was written here to remind people of the old country. But if people are emotionally attached to something and it has a positive resonance to it, that can be the basis for a meaningful identity. Um, and, you know, language is one of the building blocks of culture. And uh, in fact, we could, they, they could have argued with us, what are you doing, doing most things in English? You should be doing it in a language because that is how you express a cultural identity. Another advantage to Yiddish was that it was distinctly Jewish. Yiddish was not a language that was written or read by non-Jewish people until very, very recently. Uh, now there are, because Yiddish is a university class, you, you get people who study Yiddish and who um, teach it who are not of Jewish background. But that's well, very, very new. And some people want to study the, you know, the, uh, the Yiddish literature of the 19th and 20th centuries and stuff like that as a, so it's as a field, right. right. Well, it's an academic field, so you can right. study it. Right. And you might need to learn the original language to right. do it, and that's how it works. Um, I, I actually had a personal benefit. I, yeah. uh, um, Yiddish was my first, Yiddish and English combined were my first language. My parents arrived from after the war, and so I spoke, they spoke both languages, and I mixed, both, both mixed them up, and I would throw in Yiddish words with my talking English and everything. So I sort of intuitively can feel it, even though I don't have a very good vocabulary. And I was in Switzerland about 40 years ago, 45 years ago. And I was able to read the signs, read the menus and kind of get along because it's close enough to the Yiddish that I was able to get by. Yeah, oh, yeah. I can read the Yiddish, uh, simple Yiddish, if it's in Roman letters. Right. I don't know the Hebrew alphabet. Right, right. I'm trying to learn it, but I'm not doing it. Yeah, much. don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but, but this also happens, like, uh, there was a Yiddish theater in Tel Aviv, but it was always German tourists who went to go see it because they could understand it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, plenty of other examples like that. My mother, um, she went to a Yiddish after-school school, one of these schools we'll be talking about, um, growing up in the, in, in the 40s and 50s, um, and part of that was to be able to speak with her grandparents. And when she went to college, she took German, but if she was having trouble with the word order, she would just say, how would my grandmother say this in English? And that helped her, you know, get the uh, to the light. I went to turn it off or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so it helped her with the uh, the German word. So yes, there's a lot of a lot of carryover from one to the other. Um, but even so, with the vocabulary, the accent, the cultural touchstones, um, it very much was a distinctly Jewish experience. Yeah. So you know, when you're writing in Yiddish, you're writing for a Jewish audience. Uh, you can make the in jokes that, you know, it, it makes it really hard actually to translate some Yiddish literature because often they'll cite stuff or make in-jokes that don't translate particularly well. Um, in fact, one of the joys I had in reading Michael Chabon's The Yiddish Policeman's Union is that sometimes he would translate phrases in Yiddish that don't make any sense in English at all into English, and either you get it or you don't. So at one point, one of the characters says, stop breaking me a teapot, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense in no, English. It doesn't. But in Yiddish, there's a phrase, Chakmir Nishkain Chinek, which means literally, don't break me a teapot, but metaphorically it means right. stop bugging me. Don't you know? Leave me alone. Or stop ringing the teapot. I think we stop ringing it, isn't it? Okay, I, I always heard yeah. it's the break, but oh. in any case, um, <laughs> way. Yeah. In any case, the point is that it's you know it's an untranslatable idiom. But yeah. in that book, he translated it to English, and either you got it or you didn't. It was just part of the sort of the ethos <laughs> there. But that's like you know it makes translating the the Tevye the Milk Band stories and so on uh, challenging because of the the references that he'll make. Um, in passing that people will just get in the audience that was reading it, many of whom came out of a religious background and wouldn't need a footnote. You know, like if, in English, if we said uh, a rose by any other name, you don't have to footnote it. You don't have to explain it that much more for, for most audiences. Um, they'll know it's from Shakespeare, but the same kind of thing would happen in Yiddish literature, and that's what made it a distinctly Jewish uh, body of uh, writing. And then finally, for this Jewish population, the Eastern European Ashkenazi heartland and its diasporas, um, this was a universal access vehicle, Yiddish language. They all spoke it, they all understood it, it was their home language. Um, so if you did programming in Yiddish, everybody 
a variety of perspectives could agree on it. You know, if your secularism means belief is a private matter and you could believe in a God or not believe in a God, then you could create a community around Yiddish because it's, it's the language, it's not theology. So you could have a kind of negative secularism where you're not sort of a positive humanist as we would define it with positive beliefs about the nature of the universe, the intervention of a God or a personal God. Well, in this case, your secularism is more, God is a private thing, we're gonna light, light Shabbat candles with a Yiddish blessing instead. Uh, that's the, the neutral common ground that we have. So it's sort of secularism by subtraction, not doing the traditional stuff, but uh, substituting with Yiddish and then we can avoid the, the God question. Um, so for some people that was an attractive option too. Um, and you know, in, the, in this era where there were dozens of Yiddish newspapers across the country, in New York in 1915, there were five Yiddish daily newspapers. There was a socialist one, a communist one, an orthodox one, and a couple others. And they had 500,000 readers in 1915 who were reading these Yiddish daily newspapers. But often you'd get somebody who would read the orthodox one and the, the socialist one because they were by worker temperament socialist and by ideology and ritual practice orthodox. And, but they could access both because Yiddish was sort of a lingua franca for uh, for Jews in that, for Ashkenazi Jews in that period. Um, there were a lot of successes for this Yiddishist movement. Um, they created, as I mentioned, these schools uh, that were Yiddish focused, but in a variety of styles, as we'll talk about um, in just a moment. Uh, in 1932, if you combined all the Yiddish language secular instruction that was being given, it was about 10% of the Jews in the country that were receiving an education were getting it through one of these Yiddish focused approaches. Uh, they had summer camps that they ran in addition to uh, what was happening in uh, the daily schools. Um, they had newspapers, as I mentioned, they had unions, they had literary journals, they had movies. There was a, a Yiddish language movie industry in this country before World War II. Hmm. Um, and there, there was also a diversity of opinions. After the Russian Revolution, it was a major dividing point because some of them were pro-Soviet and some of them were anti-Soviet, which also you know, tore the union movement apart in the 19, uh, teens and 20s. Uh, also divided the Jews as well. So at one point in upstate New York, there were three camps within a you know a certain radius of each other. One was called Kinder Ring, which was the socialist anti-communist summer camp run by the Workman Circle, also called Arbiter Ring. The second was Camp Kinderlon, which had started as a Workman Circle camp, but then went with the fully communist communists when the split happened. And so that was being run by the International Workers' Order, or IWO. And the third group was Camp Kindervelt, which was run by the labor Zionists who did things in Yiddish too. And so you had these Yiddish language, three different Yiddish language camps, all providing a secular Jewish identity with a different flavor. So at Workman Circle, they would sing Die Shvua, which is the, the, uh, the Bund anthem in Yiddish uh, for the, um, it's called the Vow, and it's about labor strife. Um, at the IWO camp, they would sing the Internationale in Yiddish. And at the Farban camp, they would sing Hatikva in Yiddish and in Hebrew yeah. <laughs> because they were labor Zionists. So um, again, different flavors and often they would be very much at each other's throats. It's the, you know, the uh, intensity of small difference. Um, but they were all doing Yiddish language education in some way and arguing over what the proper way to do it was. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of uh, some documents from this period that really reflect some of the uh, values and challenges that, um, that the people had to deal with. So this is a document from the early founding of the secular schools in the 19 teens. As I mentioned, the first school was founded in 1910. This is a conference being held for the Workman Circle. Again, you can hear the labor movement side of that name, right? Arbiter Ring, Arbiter is worker. Uh, the Workman Circle, now Worker Circle, um, was trying to organize their schools. What are their goals? To teach the children to read, write, and speak Yiddish well to acquaint them with the best segments, uh, specimens of Yiddish literature. Number three, to acquaint them with the life of the worker and the broad Jewish masses in America and other countries. So not parochial, right? Know your Jewishness, know your Yiddish language, but also be, have sympathy for the working class everywhere. You don't want to be so divided by bourgeois nationalism. That's, that's right. a danger. Right. Number four, acquaint them with the history of the Jewish people and with episodes in general history of the struggle for freedom. So again, you see this universal and particular balance here. To develop within them the feelings of love, uh, justice, love for the oppressed, love of freedom, and so this is the socialism side. 
to develop within them feeling for beauty and physical and moral discipline, that's individual development, and to develop within them idealism and the striving to perform noble acts which are necessary for every child of the oppressed class to make his way through life toward a better order. So you get the optimism and the hope, but also the, the grit to be a, you know, a fighting socialist. So you can see how this is trying to articulate goals that are a balance of Jewish literary awareness and literacy, um, at least focused on Yiddish literature. It doesn't say much about Jewish holidays or it talks about Jewish history. And then of course the broader socialist message. Now, a later discussion uh, highlights the fact that part of the problem with Jewish literacy is if you read the early stories, they're really important, but a great many of these legends are permeated with the religious element, which does not harmonize with the secularism of the arbitrary schools. This is on the right side. Therefore, they decide the curriculum can include the legends of the patriarchs, but only those in which the element of God and religion is not predominant. That's kind of hard. So like Joseph and his brothers, uh, yes, and, you know, yeah. so you can find a few of them, but again, it's sort of a tricky balance there. <laughs> and then at the end, um, one of the things I find really uh, fascinating is which, um, which holidays they decided were okay to celebrate. So they start in the spring. Passover, the Jewish holiday of freedom. You want a, a working movement, Jewish holiday, Passover is fantastic, right? Slaves and Pharaoh, and works out well. <laughs> second one, whoops, I'll go back. Uh, second one is called Lagba Omer. Why is it going up? Go up, go up. There we go. Okay, so the second one is called Lagba Omer, which is the counting of the Omer from Passover toward Shavuot. Um, and it's a memory of the struggle of the rebellion of Bar Kokhba and Rabbi Kiva. Supposedly there was, they were caught and persecuted around that time, or Kiva would go out and hide with the students and um, study in the woods around that. But what's fascinating is they have the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer, but they don't have Shavuot at the end. No. Because Shavuot was understood to be um, either an agricultural harvest holiday, which the urban proletariat doesn't really experience, or the revelation of the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai, which is a religious element that's not appropriate for the secular schools. So, so they, count the, they count 33 days and then give up because they don't have the end of it. That's strange. They do include the first of May. It's the yeah. holiday of labor, right? Yeah. Labor brotherhood, an expression of world peace. They include Hanukkah as a holiday of emancipation from the Greek yoke. See, they were not assimilationists. They wanted to maintain a distinct Jewish identity. If the Greeks were trying to wipe out Jews as a separate cultural group, then you have to fight. And so Hanukkah is a resistance to that. It's also a kind of anti-colonial message too. March 18th, the holiday of labor struggle for freedom. I think this is the founding of the first union in uh, among um, textile workers I in England. I have no idea what that is. No. Yeah. Purim is a children's holiday for costuming gifts and other amusements. As long as you don't actually read the Book of Esther, it's okay for kids. <laughs> Um, July 4th, oh, oh, sorry, question? No. Um, July 4th, the holiday of American freedom. February 12th, Lincoln's birthday, emancipation of the Negroes. Racial justice was actually an early priority for the socialist movement, and to their credit, they were very active on that front. Um, and then number nine, I love as well, Russian Revolution. The conference leaves to each school the choice of the day. Different calendars. Well, there's yeah. the, the different calendars, right? October, November Revolution, but also different Russian revolutions right. because there was the Perensky Revolution right. in March, March and then there was the Bolshevik takeover in October, November. And so rather than get into the calendar vagaries and the which socialism is the right socialism right. to celebrate vagaries, they just say each school can decide which Russian revolution they want to celebrate. Unless you want to be a Trotsky guy, in which case. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, uh, the Trotsky supported the... Um, the Bolshevik to begin Yeah, the, but they might have looked back with nostalgia on the, um, on the uh, Peresky uh, revolution. So uh, let me uh, just change which um, document we're going to look at because there's another couple that are interesting. Um, this is a, a document that describes the membership of the International Workers' Order organized by language groups. And this is in 1947. So... If you, you'll see this um, starting from right to left. The 15th far, let's see, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Fraternal, Fraternal, Gesellschaften, Societies, Fundem Internationalen Arbiter Orden, from the International Workers Order. Okay? And the first line, and you'll notice it's 56,000 more than any two groups put together, is Yiddisher. <laughs> Fraternal, uh, Fraternal Volksorden, the Jewish 
people's you know, uh, orders, uh, the fraternal people's order, folks order. Um, and again, there's 56,000 compared to any other group. In fact, the next closest group is the uh, Algemeine or the English ones, English. So if, uh, if you imagine a good chunk of those English speakers are probably Jews too. Uh, they just wanted to be listed as English and not Yiddish speakers. Um, a good chunk of the membership of the International Workers' Order, this you know multi-ethnic group, is Jewish. You know, uh, maybe even as much as half. That would also include Ukrainish, so Ukrainian, Russish, Russian, and again, some of those might include uh, Jews as well. Um, Slav, oh, Slovakish, so Slovakian, uh, Ungarish, Hungary, Hungarian. But again, these numbers are 11, 10,000. The Jews are 56,000 members. And notice, this is in 1947. This is, you know, the beginning of the House and American Activities Committee investigation. This is post-war, uh, beginning of the Cold War. And still, large numbers of Jews are active in these particular areas. Okay, so this is the cover of a history book about Yiddish secular education, as you can see, from 1910 to 1960. Uh, and this woman did a wonderful job of archival research to um, find all of the um, uh, please, please. all of the key background. Oh, is it? Let's see. Yeah, it should be there. Okay. Uh, and let me just pull up the window one second. Okay. So I, I did this just so we could zoom in a little bit to see, because uh, she's got three really fascinating pictures here. One, on the left, you can see people developing a play. This is probably a Steve Purim play, play yeah. a kid's play, that this teacher is trying to get the kids to learn their lines and go to the right place. And, uh, and often these teachers were workers too. This was something they did on their free time or in addition time because these communities weren't robust enough and they were being supported by workers so they didn't have the money to pay full-time staff. So it was really a collectivist uh, kind of an endeavor there to create the costumes and, and do the plays and so on. On the right, you'll see these young women doing a dance and if you read the caption in Yiddish, which we're not going to zoom in close enough to see, it would say, this is at Camp Kinderland. It is a memorial dance on the second yard site of Sacco and Vanzetti. Oh. <laughs> now, Sacco and Vanzetti were two Italian anarchists who were yeah. put to death after a, a labor dispute. Right, yeah. exactly. But notice, in this Jewish summer camp, they're doing a memorial dance in very not traditional Jewish dress, yeah. right? Well, yeah. uh, it looks um, like nymphs. <laughs> right, exactly. But they're doing a memorial dance, and they're using the word yard site, you know, the anniversary of a death, which is part of Jewish practice for Sacco and Vanzetti, who are heroes of the socialist movement. So this is a great visual depiction of that, you know, um, intersection of the universalist and the particular identity. And then the third one is this magazine right in the middle. What it says... Is, uh, the name of the, it's a literary journal for kids that these groups published. It says Kinder, right over the top, which means children. Although actually what it says is Arbiter Kinder, if you read the letters inside, workers' children, mm. or children workers. Mm. And then across the banner, it says, Mir lernen und kämpfen. We learn and we fight, or we struggle. But they made it like hammers and sickles. But yes, if you look at the shape <laughs> of the letters, yeah. it looked like hammers and sickles because this is a pro-Soviet, um, you know, journal. And again, at the bottom, it says the International Arbiter or the International Workers Order, IWO, just in, uh, in Yiddish letters. So this is, I, I find, a wonderful sort of depiction of that, uh, that world. And, and keep in mind, I mean, to publish a literary journal takes staff, takes energy, takes time, and, and the, you know, publishing tens of thousands of uh, copies of this. Um, and then the last one I was going to, oh, the last one is the discussion questions for later. So those were the two images I wanted you to see. So with all that, there aren't a large number of these communities around anymore. Right? There, there is still a workman's circle out there that has a few communities, but nothing like the hundreds of uh, camps and schools and uh, uh, adult communities that were described in Friedenreich's book. Um, the International Workers' Order is basically gone. There's a United Jewish People's Order in Canada that's still around, but again, uh, a fraction of what it was. Um, and uh, you know, wh why this decline? Why, why is it not uh, uh, where it was? Well, there's a number of factors. Uh, we have to remember, first of all, there wasn't a continuing flow of new immigrants coming that would be coming from the Yiddish-speaking heartland to America. Uh, that, that helps to maintain linguistic you know, fluency. If you have grandparents and uncles and people continually coming that are only speaking that language. Um, in 1924, the United States immigration laws changed to make it much harder to right. have people from Eastern and Southern Europe 
get admission to the country. And even in the, during the pressure of the pre-Holocaust in the 1930s, there were some German and Polish Jews who managed to make it in, but it was a fraction of the numbers that had been flooding in in the previous generation. So the lack of immigration made a big difference. Obviously, the Holocaust made a terrible difference because you killed off you know, millions of Jews, the vast majority of whom were Yiddish speakers. You know, probably five out of the six million were native Yiddish speakers. You've got some German speakers, some French speakers, a few uh, Latino speakers coming out of the, the Sephardic diaspora and the Balkans and so on. Uh, but the vast majority are Yiddish speakers. And, you know, that's, that's a, a terrible loss to the culture. And not to mention all the books that were burned and all the communities that were destroyed and, uh, you know, cultural memory wiped out and so on. Um, also in this time period, you have a Soviet crackdown on Yiddish. Early on in the Soviet Union, they actually built on some of the things the Bund had been talking about and these Yiddish cultural nationalists have been talking about. They created what they called Yevsexia, Jewish sections of the Communist Party that sponsored Yiddish language newspapers and Yiddish language schools and Yiddish language cultural experiments, uh, theaters and other kind of performances. Yiddish poets were sponsored. All this was shut down after World War II. Uh, it was another one of uh, Stalin's purges. There was a famous uh, night of the murdered Soviet poets, I think it's in August of 1947, where a number of them are killed all in one night. Uh, they'd been useful to raise support for the war and to go raise money in America. And, but you know, now it's done. Stuff. No, yeah, but yeah. Stalin cracked down and uh, I mean, near the end of his life, there was a theory that Jewish doctors were trying to poison him and there was a fear that they were gonna be rounding up more Jews to ship them off to Siberia or whatever. Um, it was it was terrible, and and it meant also the end of this golden age of Soviet Yiddish literature um, and creativity and cultural um, production. Uh, at one time, there was a Jewish autonomous region in Siberia called Biro Bijan, um, which had street signs in Yiddish and government support for Yiddish cultural programming and so on. But again, a lot of that is shut down after this uh, Soviet crackdown. Um, so that's uh, you know lost by Hitler, lost by Stalin. It, uh, it got in both ways. Um, another reason for the decline of these Yiddish-speaking communities was they had hitched their wagon to socialism. If you know anything about American history in the 1940s and 50s, yeah. <laughs> being a socialist or a communist was a tough way to make a living. You know, or it was tough to make a living if you were there. Um, and, uh, and many of them were, you know, sort of soft socialists, but not hardline communists. Some of them were hardline communists, but even being associated with anything vaguely socialist was anathema. Not to mention they were secular, and this was the heyday of American ecumenism, where Eisenhower famously said, I don't care what kind of God you believe in, as long as you believe in a God versus those atheist communists. You know? So uh, being a secular Jewish community was tough, being a uh, socialist out there in the world was tough, uh, but also, honestly, Jews were somewhat successful. Those labor unions worked so that the children of the garment workers didn't have to go into the garment factories. Right. They could go to college or to a trade school and get you know, a more advanced, uh, they might be pharmacists or they might own a grocery store. And then the next generation goes to college and becomes a doctor or a lawyer or work in the government or you know, a white collar profession. Well, once you're living in the suburbs, first of all, you're not in the dense ethnic Jewish neighborhood anymore. You most likely have learned other languages you know, you're, you might have grown up speaking Yiddish at home, but once you went to school, it's the classic immigrant dynamic of, you know, the parents speak in the foreign language and the kid responds in English, because that's what they're used to. Um, some parents actually used Yiddish as a secret language, because they didn't want the kids to know what they were saying, so they would say things in Yiddish. Now, as a parent, I can understand the value of a, of a secret language. Um, and I will tell you, one of the problems of my life is when my kids learn how to spell because then we couldn't say I-C-E-C-R-E-A-M without them knowing what we were talking about. My grandparents um, my dad. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so once, uh, so, but, but the problem is, if you keep Yiddish as a secret language that you don't teach the kids, they don't, know. They don't learn it. And they don't teach it to their kids. You know, so, so you lose the language uh, experience that way between the no longer ethnic neighborhoods, living in suburbia, going to college, acculturating to the surrounding culture, and to be honest, getting more affluent. Because right. if you have a two-car garage yeah. in the suburbs, in your house that you own, do you really want a workers' revolution that's gonna upend everything? I mean, you're in the bourgeoisie, you know? Um, so it, it became less attractive to maintain those socialist ideas. Plus, to be honest, half of the socialist program was adopted by FDR in the New Deal anyways, so it was respectable to be a Democrat, even if you had the same political agenda. Yeah. Um, so between that and 
uh, the affluent side of things. You know, Jews didn't flood to the Republican Party. There's a famous uh, sociologist, uh, I think Milton Hillenfarb was his name, who said that Jews earn like Episcopalians and vote like Puerto Ricans. Um, <laughs> their income levels uh, would suggest they vote much more Republican, but they tend to vote much more Democratic, like a lower income demographic group. Um, so, and it's a holdover of the socialist uh, heritage, for sure. When you move out to the suburbs also, a new Jewish institution begins to build, be built, actually two of them. One is the Jewish Community Center. Mm. So now you can go have a schwitz, you know, have a sweat, you can go exercise, you can go to cultural classes, book fairs, concerts, and feel connected to the Jewish people that way without having to join a specifically cultural Jewish organization. And the other thing you find when you move out there are all these new synagogues. And the way that Jews were acceptable in being part of communities in the suburbs was in a synagogue, in a religious framework. Just like you had ethnic parishes of the Catholic Church or the function of the Lutheran Church for Swedes and Norwegians in Minnesota and in the Dakotas and so on, they organized around the church rather than as a fraternal cultural organization. It sort of did dual duty. So even if you never kept kosher at home, you might join a conservative synagogue because that's where your people were. The people from your neighborhood, the people from the town you were from, there were still Hungarian synagogues and Romanian synagogues mm. and so on. But in the suburbs, that was the acceptable way to affiliate Jewishly. You were respectable if you joined a synagogue. I'm not gonna step back down to the city for that socialist Yiddish language school for my kids when I'm living out in the suburbs in the 1950s. And finally, the last sort of nail in the coffin, if I can use that metaphor, is the birth of the state of Israel. Because now, in that battle between Yiddish and Hebrew, if I'm going to learn a Jewish language, maybe I'm going to want my kids to know Hebrew. Because Israel is the people that fought back. Israel is the uh, sort of the folk dance uh, world of you know, native Jewish culture, even though it's artificial, but that's what folk dances are in most cases. It's, <laughs> you make it up to make people feel native. Um, but uh, you know, Hebrew gets a, a greater cachet. And, you can even see it in the pronunciation of Hebrew. People who learned Hebrew in the 30s and 40s often learned it with an Ashkenazi Yiddish accent, Shabbos and Sukkot, and the, the Kaddish prayer would be Yiskadal the Yiskadash. But people going to Hebrew schools in the 60s and 70s began to learn it with a Hebrew Israeli style pronunciation. So it's Yitkadal the Yitkadash, and Shabbat, and Sukkot. And, you know, uh, that's, that's part of the shift in community politics, but the language becomes a proxy for that. Yeah. Um, and it's, again, it's hard to compete. You know, um, Yiddish, you might do Yiddish in addition to Hebrew, and there are still some places that do that in Latin America, um, but it's very tough to sell Yiddish instead of Hebrew um, in, you know, in, in the world of uh, post-war America. I so, thought it was interesting. My, my grandmother came over at seven, and her sister was nine. And, and dad had come over in 1904 when they were only four. Mm -hmm. And he worked in the streets of New York for three years to raise money and then bring over his wife and two kids. And he wanted them to go to Yiddish school in New York. And they said, no. Right. He says, we live in America now. That's the old you know, country. That's yeah. the old country. And they were kids. So they went to the public, high, the public schools in New York. And I never heard my grandmother speak Yiddish ever. And I, she probably knew it, but she never spoke it to anybody, and not even her sister. And my father, you know, knew New York Yiddish, which is bits and pieces, and you know, but not, yeah. not as just not like as you know a, the swear words and the delivery. right. But it was not. But he didn't know it as a as a living language in any way, as far as I know. Anyway. Right. Right. So it's just interesting. And then we moved to the suburbs, and we had two temples. We had a reform temple, and we had a conservative temple. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's funny, but it's what you're describing is exactly my exactly experience. Right. Yeah. Right. And my parents. So I. I Oh, please. Go ahead. Sorry, I think of Highland Park as a diverse city. We have um, Reformed Jews, Conservative yeah, Jews, yeah. Humanistic Jews, and, yeah, and some Orthodox Jews. Right, right, right. We just don't have any Falasha, that's all. There's also Catholics and other, I mean, you know, there are those other buildings in town that are yeah. you know, called churches and uh, people do go there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the, uh, the irony, you know, when you wind up at these neighborhoods. So Jews, let's say, were living in the Lower East Side of Manhattan or the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, and they were 80%, 90% of the population. And so the schools would close the Jewish holidays or, yeah. you know, 
And then they move out to the suburbs and they're like 50 to 60 percent because they often move to similar suburbs, you know, yeah. similar rings. Well, and so my on. school is half and half, but we actually right. got Jewish and Christian holidays off. I mean, but, but Yom Kippur was definitely a holiday. Right, you know? right. But as time has gone on, you know, as you disperse further and further yeah. out in the next generations, yeah. now you're in a 20, 30 percent Jewish area or even less. Again, it's hard to maintain Yiddish as your primary connection when you're not speaking with anybody. We don't have neighbors that are right. So, and this is the case of other languages. You talk to third or fourth generation oh, yeah. uh, Hispanics, Latinos, they they often are not fluent. I, I did a wedding for um, James Lopez, uh, who married a Jewish woman. Um, he's a, I think, fourth generation uh, Mexican background with the name Lopez, but he doesn't really speak Spanish. <laughs> Because it's that immigrant experience in America after a few yeah. generations, it's very yeah. tough to, to maintain. And and that was in the end one of the weaknesses of the Yiddishist approach that it just didn't, without the heartland of Eastern Europe, where right. it was the native language for people, right. um, it was just tough to maintain that as the core of your Jewish identity. Now there is a kind of Yiddish renaissance going on where you can study it in universities yeah. and there's a Klezmer music revival that began in the 1970s and 80s That's uh, that was also sort of sparked by the multicultural moment where you get people getting back into folk music and folk dancing and so Jews begin to say, well, what's our folk music? What's our folk dancing? And they find this customer music that people had almost forgotten by the 1970s and they're finding these albums from the 20s and 30s with Yiddish you know, um, labels on them that their grandparents might have listened to. And then it becomes a, a kind of revival and there are new Klezmer bands that come out. We'll actually listen to a, a Klezmer piece at the end, uh, at the end of class. Uh, but the Klezmer revival and, and so on and these university classes, is that resurrecting a living language? It's more like studying it. You know, it's tricky. It's tricky. You know, I mean, are you going to speak to your kids in Yiddish yeah. and make them answer you in Yiddish? Are you going to sing lullabies in Yiddish? You know, that, that was a tr trouble for Esperanto too. It's just tough to read yeah. a living language that becomes your mama lush and your, yeah. your mother tongue in that way. Yeah. I think it can be done with enough ideological rigor. As we'll see, the, the Hebrew people did that in Israel, right? right? Yeah. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of focus and it's a lot of effort. And North Shore Senior Center has a Yiddish class. They do, right, because a lot of these people, again, if they're 70s, 80s, and so on, they grew up in the 30s, 40s. Their parents are from that 10s, 20s, you know, yeah. uh, period. So they might have heard a lot of Yiddish at home and now they're trying to add to it. Um, but again, they're not teaching their grandkids the Yiddish language in the, in the same way. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there is a large body of people in America that do still speak Yiddish. They're just not secular. They're the ultra-Orthodox mm. in their own towns, in New Square, their own neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And they use Yiddish as a shield right. against the outside world. So they teach their kids in Yiddish. Um, and it, it happens in Israel, too. Some of them won't use Hebrew for daily language. They use Yiddish because, again, Hebrew is the Loishan Koydish, the holy language. You shouldn't say, where's the bathroom in <laughs> Hebrew. You could say that in Yiddish. Um, and so uh, Yiddish is still being spoken by thousands of Jews in America. It's just they're the ultra-Orthodox Jews. Yeah. Um, there's a language app on your phone called Duolingo, which you can use to learn all different kinds of languages. Mm -hmm. And they recently, I think last year, the, last year or the year before, they released a Yiddish version of Duolingo. But one of the debates they had was which version are we going to include? Because <laughs> there was Northern Yiddish and Southern Yiddish and there's Hasidic uh, style Yiddish and there's Yiddish yeah. with English inflection because yeah. of course Yiddish has been in America for over 150 years and it's going to pick up English terms as well. Um, and so in the end, they settled on a Hasidic style Yiddish with some of the Germanic style influences that the uh, so-called Northern Yiddish would have had in it. But some native Yiddish speakers listen to it and think, well, where is this coming from? Because <laughs> it feels sort of uh, clunky. It's not one style consistently all the way through. Do what about Ladino? Is that, does that have any of these kinds of, you know, very similar features because, again, it was a medieval Spanish written in Hebrew letters that is maintained when they move into the Ottoman Empire. So even if they're living in Salonika or they're living in Izmir or in Istanbul, um, where people around them are speaking Turkish or Greek or other languages, they have their own internal language of Ladino that they use for their community, and they use Hebrew for ritual practice too. Um, so it's a very similar dynamic of what um, one scholar called internal bilingualism where you have your external language for business and commerce and whatever, um, but then you have your internal languages that you use for yourself for different purposes in different places. Um, and so that's sort of quirky uh, to the Jewish community to have those two languages. And that's still languages. sort of widespread or... Whatever. Well, there, there are still some. Again, large numbers of Ladino-speaking Jews were wiped out in the Holocaust yeah. if they were in the Balkans where a lot of them still live. 
uh, but they've also been around for long enough that they've begun to assimilate away as well. Um, I mean, the first Jews in America were Sephardic Jews. You get uh, names like Lopez yeah, and yeah. Um, Garcia and so on there, and you're sort of, what? <laughs> these are Jewish names, Aaron Lopez, but they were these Sephardic Jews. Mm -hmm. But after a few generations, they intermarried with the Ashkenazi population, or they intermarried with the non-Jewish population, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't maintain sort of that uh, integrity to keep Ladino as their primary language. Um, you can still go to a Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in New York that maintains sort of the ritual practice, but my guess is you'll feel very little Ladino there because it's not a living language in that way. There is a larger Ladino-speaking community in Seattle, I believe, yeah. um, some refugees from the Balkans and other mm -hmm. places. Um, there are still some Ladino speakers in Istanbul and some in Israel as well. There's actually a Netflix show called The Beauty Queen of Jerusalem, which includes Ladino because it's set around the turn of the, the 20th century uh, with a Sephardic family living in Jerusalem. But they do speak Ladino in the in the film, so that's a nice uh, hmm. cultural relic. But again, it's not you know a rebirth of Ladino as a living language in the same way. Uh, I mean, there's a wonderful song we sing in our Sunday school called uh, Ocho Candelicas, which was written in the 1980s by a Sephardic music uh, creator named Flori Jagoda, who came from the Balkans and was a, uh, escaped the Holocaust. And in the 80s, she said, "I'm going to write a new Hanukkah song in Ladino because we're still here." And we should, and so we still sing it. She's long gone, hmm. but again, it's it's a it's a taste. Hmm. You know, it's not it's not the living language in, in the same way. It. I mean, I don't know what it sounds like. Oh, Ocho Candelica? Yeah, no, I mean, oh, Ladino, Ladino in general. I've yeah. heard plenty of Yiddish, but not. Yeah, I mean, you can you know you can look up online. You can find people. There there are advocates who are you know pushing Ladino hmm. uh, as well, and it's it's not gone, but it's just you know a shadow of what it was uh, what it was before, um, and so that's. That's part of our challenge when we're looking back for a legacy, you know, what are we going to use here? We're not going to learn a new language, you know, we're not even going to learn an old language uh, that we know some words in. It, it's not going to be the basis of our identity, but you do lose something without having a language to base your cultural identity. You know, that, that's just a richer way of doing it. Um, and so there, there is something to be said for the Hebrew approach that Israel took and the Zionists took where they, they said to do a secular identity, you need a living language every day. And they managed to build a society that could do that. Um, so you can swear at the cab driver in Hebrew. You can ask for directions in Hebrew. You can listen to pop music in Hebrew. You can uh, read newspapers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all, all the time. In America, we're doing it in English. And we can do it, you know, in Jewish style English. And we can inflect things a little bit. And, you know, and throw some uh, Hebrew and chutzpah and, you know, little phrases here and there. Um, but uh, it's it's not the same as having a language, so uh, it's, it's it's worth admitting that. Really hard to do. I mean, it's amazing that this Israel managed to do it, but they have a good incentive, maybe. But yeah. you know, they've been trying for years to bring back Cornish, and it's not nothing's happened. And Welsh and, and, and York yeah, and and Yorkish. Well, Welsh and, yeah. isn't so bad, but Cornish is. Yeah, because there are people that speak Welsh, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's 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 tough. It's an uphill battle. Yeah. Yeah. So I did want to share with you one uh, one other text. Let's see. Um, oh, I forgot to open it. So let me um, just open this quickly. This is from our, oh, I can't minimize Zoom while I'm recording the meal. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, all right, never mind. I'll, I'll skip it. Um, I will just commend to you um, the readings in the course packet that are key to Judaism in a Secular Age. Include some examples of short stories by Mendel and Mofer Sforum and Yudlamit Peretz and Shol Malechem, who are sort of the three giants of Yiddish literature from the end of the 19th to early 20th centuries. And you can look at those short stories and get a sense of, you know, what are they grappling with here? Uh, Peretz in particular is very funny. He has a story called The Pious Cat, which uh, imagines a, a cat as if it's, you might remember this from the I, earlier version of the class. Yeah, um, I've read that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've read the whole book. Right. Time. It's just been a couple of years now. But, the, but the Pious Cat imagines, imagines the cat like saying blessings and oh, washing right. yeah, his yeah, hands yeah. Yeah, before yeah. he kills the bird again. and. Um, so it's sort of pointing out the hypocrisy of religiosity for, from a secular perspective. But again, he's making jokes that the audience will get. Um, and the, the Tevye stories of Shalom Aleichem, again, are, are similar to that, although the originals are a lot more gritty uh, than the, uh, the Fiddler on the Roof version. You know, that's written for an American audience. So you have the aspirational, if I were a rich yeah, man, yeah. right? Um, but none of the socialist angst about why are there so many rich people and why am I so poor and starving? Yeah. You do have that in his original stories. Mm. So the music write, musical writers for America in the 1960s decided let's soften that uh, anti-rich messaging because that's too socialist for the audience we're playing to here. 
And they also soften the anti-intermarriage message because in the Sholem Aleichem stories, um, you don't get the happy ending for the uh, the daughter that marries out, where he finally accepts them and tells her where she, mm-hmm. they're going to be and so on. It's just the, the negative ending um, that doesn't have the happy ending. But that's, again, you know, written in the 1910s and 20s, right. uh, you know, when Jews are being persecuted by pogroms in Eastern Europe. Yeah. But there's no happy ending there. So nice, life stinks. Um, so uh, the, the time and place makes it different for how the stories are told. But so you have those stories in there as well. And you have a couple essays by some of those cultural autonomists who wanted to create an autonomous Jewish culture um, based in Yiddish language, but also in a more constructive way. So the one passage I was going to read uh, that I'm not going to call up, but I'll just read the passage to you. It's on page uh, 92 of uh, the uh, of the essay by Chaim Jitlovsky, who was a big advocate for Yiddish cultural schools in America, not just in Eastern Europe. Um, initially, the people who break away from religion try hard to defy the God in which they do not believe. They, uh, they become a thorn in the eyes of people who are still stuck to the old beliefs. If formerly it was forbidden to smoke on Shabbos, to eat on Yom Kippur, it now becomes a mitzvah to smoke on Shabbos, <laughs> to organize Yom Kippur parties. Um, and so it becomes like intentional violation. But gradually the anger fades. And the urge to fight an opponent who doesn't even exist grows weaker. The heretic sees Jews running to, sh- to shul on Sukkot. Uh, he sees Shabbos candles. It leaves him cold. He doesn't care. He's not love or hate. It's sort of indifferent. But as uh, Zielowski says, gods are born to eternal life. You know, there's a, a nostalgia for this. It goes back along many centuries. They are no longer strange, these religious customs and emotions, even to the most rational or militant atheists. When we sit up at a meeting and we stand up to honor a fallen, a fallen hero, it's a kind of religious ceremony, isn't it? The same psychological transference takes place in the modern non-believer with regard to ceremonies that are part of the ancient Jewish religion. When he listens to the lament of the cantor on Tisha B'Av, when his eyes follow the graceful undulations of the willow branches on Sukkot, when he watches his mother bless the Sabbath candles, for him at that moment, these ceremonies are not supernatural commandments but the poetic embodiment of thoughts and feelings that he considers humanly sanctified. They're holy because they're meaningful to us, yeah. right? It's the people that make them important, not the command of this. And so the kind of grappling that Jodlowski was doing with what do I do with this tradition is the same kind of debates that we have in humanistic Judaism and have for, uh, for the last two generations. Uh, what to keep, what to let go, how to balance it, just like those Jewish socialists were debating which holiday to celebrate and how to be a socialist and a Jew and what to teach. We have the same conversations today. How much of the Bible to do? What do we do with the God stuff in the Bible? Just my, my last visit to our um, uh, kindergarten, first, second grade class, the kids are all asking, well, what, a, what about God in these stories? And Is there a God? And what do you do with this God? And uh, how do you understand it? Why, why does he confuse all the language at the Tower of Babel? And, uh, that's not nice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but we're willing to look at the stories as stories. And he's a character in the story. But we're still having to deal with the fact that we're secular and we're reading stories with a god in it, and how do we square that circle? Um, well, so, you, you the said, same, same conversation. It seems to me you said, I think you said um, some time ago about that that the humanists look at, at God as an actor in the script of the, of the Jewish Testament, as mm-hmm. opposed to God being the creator of the Jewish Testament. Right, right. I mean, just like Zeus is a character in right. Greek mythology, the, uh, Yahweh is a character in the uh, Jewish stories, and you know, he makes mistakes and he gets angry and he does things people do because people wrote it and they projected themselves into it. So we're sort of uh, past time to be able to go through our discussion questions, but you're welcome to take a look at it. It's already a quarter to nine. Um, but, you know, one of the challenges that we can ask ourselves is, was it naive of the Yiddishists to try to um, build a secular Jewish identity in the early 20th century based on Yiddish language and culture? Um, or was it plausible that they, that they could have made it if things had gone differently? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's naive at all. I mean, I, th- th- there's, I mean, I don't think it's any more naive than any other group that's becoming secular. I mean, you know, in- English is, is the language of the King James Bible. You know, and English, obviously, you know, Christianity is very heavily, but that doesn't mean that in the 20th century, in the 21st century, that English 
it can't be secular. And I think that Yiddish is a secular creation as well as a religious creation. I mean, it, 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 it through it, people learn their religion, but it's still the secular language of culture. Everyday and, life. Everyday right. life. And, yeah. and, and so it's, you simply remove the, the, the religious elements out of it. And I don't see, I mean, I think that it would, would, was perfectly reasonable. The, the problem would have been whether, if there had not been the Holocaust and not been World War II, you know, where would these states have gone? Would they, would they, would communist state have collapsed at some point? You know, because, because the, 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 just looking at the history of my own family, the, the, the urge to uh, assimilate is very high. And as you say, as, as they move out the suburbs and then they get scattered beyond that and there's intermarriage, mm -hmm. um, the community just disappears in some way into the dominant culture. I mean, and right. I think that we see that in just the United States, Canada, Australia, I mean, just wherever we have these sorts of multiple ethnic communities, they tend to start dissipating at some point. Yeah, I mean, you know, if it had been only one, if it had been only the immigration laws or only the Soviets closing down the Yevsexia, or only, yeah. you know, if there had been only one of those factors, it might have continued for, you know, uh, for quite a long time. Yeah, but it still would have um, run into problems. At some it would have had its own challenges, but yeah. it would have been a much more, because of the energy invested in it, it would have been a much uh, slower process. Yeah. Um, but um, when you have yeah. such a, a radical loss of yeah. uh, numbers um, for a language, you know, that wasn't, a, you know, a Chinese kind of, you know, billion speaker language, even then, um, it, uh, it just became very difficult to maintain as a secular institution. Honestly, uh, some of the largest numbers of people experiencing and enjoying Yiddish culture today, the translators, the you know, people writing essays and so on, um, some of them come out of the secular Yiddish world because they had fanatic parents who drilled it into them and they know it. Uh, but a lot of them came out of the ultra-Orthodox world and left Orthodoxy. Yeah. But they still own Yiddish. Yeah. And so they use their Yiddish now to translate it to be, you know, cultural consultants. And, um, you know, the, when uh, the New York Times last year had a huge expose article on the lack of secular studies in um, Jewish institutions, ultra-Orthodox Jewish institutions in New York City. Mm -hmm. And they're required to provide a substantial equivalent to the secular curriculum. Uh, even if it's not getting government, you know, money directly, which many of them are for busing and other things, um, they're supposed to provide a substantially equivalent education in English, in civics, in mathematics, and some mm -hmm. core curricular elements that these schools simply don't do that. They are drilling Jewish studies all the time, and English they throw at the end of the day for an hour, nobody takes it seriously, and the people teaching it don't know them their English that well half the time, uh, because they came from the same school system. So there was a huge expose of this um, system, and they printed it in Yiddish as well as in English. The New York Times did. The New York Times did. Interesting. Yeah, I, I saw it. Because... I, I didn't tell you about it. Because they wanted people in that community to be able, to read, it. To be able to read it. And if it was just in English, it would have been a lot harder for them to read it. Well, this is sort of like uh, the Amish, in a sense, too. I mean, if you wanted to get to the Amish to read something, you know, you'd, you'd kind of have to do it in Pennsylvania Dutch, because that's what they use. That's right. what they read. That's what they talk. And they're the only group, really, that does it anymore in that area, pretty much. I mean, yeah. I think everybody else has sort of stopped speaking. Right, sure. right. So that's, uh, but the point is that somebody did that translation, right? Yeah. <laughs> somebody took yeah. the New York Times article and they hired someone to put yeah. it into Yiddish so that they could, you know, and the person who did that, my guess is, was somebody who came out of that ultra Orthodox world and left it, but still has the knowledge. So, and the irony is, those people are reliving the same story of their great great grandparents who did the same thing. Yud Lamed Peretz and Shalom Aleichem, they were raised in Orthodox homes and in orthodox schooling and then left it but their yiddish literature was their bridge yeah. to the old world yeah. um, and in fact there's a, a funny story in the um, memoir uh, <clears throat> unorthodox by deborah feldman um, where she goes to the library and takes out a yiddish book because she's always learned that yiddish books are you know uh, content appropriate but it's actually a book by Sholem Aleichem that talks about sex and it has, you know, people breaking <laughs> rules and all that. And she's like, what? This Yiddish book is that? What? But because he, you know, he's going through that questioning phase. The fact you went to a library in the first place was already, you know, beyond the pale to some extent because other books are there that are more dangerous. Uh, but it turns out she thought she was going safe with the, taking a Yiddish book. Um, and it might look safe in the language, but when you actually read it, 
the, the content could be something much more, <laughs> much more complicated. 